Great. Well, welcome everyone to our spring semester anti-racism lecture series. This is our fourth topic, I believe, um, for this semester so far. We have a few others before the end of the um, of the school year, but tonight we have with us Dr. Agnes Berkey. Um, she's a faculty member here at Caldwell University, and she will be speaking on racism and research, um, which I think is a very interesting topic, uh, given, given we're a higher ed institution and a lot of research takes place in academia. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Berkey, and uh, you can take it away. I would like to thank everyone for, for being here and also I really thank you for inviting me. So it's a very interesting topic and it's very timely. Uh, um, and uh, I'm so happy that we are here and we can discuss and I really like, would like to be have a discussion. So if you have anything to add or comment, just please feel free. Uh, we also have a little bit of some exercises to think together. So hopefully it will be kind of a fun at the same time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to present now and then this way everyone is going to see my, my um, screen. And here um, I'm going to present and so maybe you can see my very first um, slide. Everybody can see my first slide? Yes. Wonderful. So um, I'm very uh, grateful for being part uh, and, uh, of this and uh, the anti-racism lecture series. And so I will talk about racism research in research in education and STEM. So it will be not a comprehensive study. It will be some studies that I selected to discuss in more depth. So maybe we can make some conclusions from them. So first, uh, firstly, I would like to go through what we're going to talk about. So give a definition of racism, and I'm sure we already heard it a couple of times in this series. And then we, I would like to really talk about one case um, where the research subject selection uh, was biased based on race, and it is a Tuskegee study, and what the outcomes of that study and uh, informed consent, and we're going to talk about what it is. And then also uh, I will kind of um, move to how a research, how racism is uh, perceived in education, uh, college acceptance, STEM degrees, uh, STEM opportunities and uh, what barriers uh, some of the minorities may have. And we're going to uh, analyze anal 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 one of the studies that I found and uh, see anti-racism in action. Uh, I found uh, NIH declaration against racism and we will have a summary and acknowledgement. So that's what's awaited for us in this talk. So let's start with the definition of racism. And it's a theory that <clears throat> believes that this, uh, the distinctive human characteristic and abilities are determined by race. And it was first uh, stated, first defined by the Oxford English Dictionary in 1989. And so, so this is a belief, it's, it's a doctrine. However, what it's going to do when someone has this uh, belief then it's going to change the behavior. So an individual action or behavior based upon or, or fostering such a doctrine, and it's going, going to cause racial discrimination. So the belief of uh, superiority will, leave, uh, will lead to certain behaviors, and then it leads to prejudice and, and or intolerance. And um, racism uh, in another forms, unfortunately, there is such a thing as institutional, structural, systemic racism. And so let's look at what that is. Uh, a policy, a system of uh, government or other entity that is associated with uh, or originated in such a doctrine. So it favors members of a dominant racial or ethnic group or has a neutral effect on their life experiences while discriminating against or harming members of the other groups and ultimately serving the, um, to preserve the social status, economic advantage, or political power of the dom dominant group. So I just wanted to go through this um, uh, definition because we're going to see how it plays out in the case study that we're going to look at. Um, and so now we're going to go and it's going to talk about um, a public health service initiative that what took place in Tusk Tuskegee Institute, Tuskegee, Al Alabama. Here, the aim was to record the natural history of uh, syphilis. And uh, they recruited 600 black men 
399 had syphilis and 201 uh, had no, uh, no, no syphilis. However, these uh, participants did not know why they are participating in the study. So what is the lie? Researchers told the men they were being treated for uh, bad blood. It was a local term used to describe several ailments, including syphilis, anemia, and fatigue. So they used the lie to, um, to get, the, get them in, involved on the study. And what, what is the truth? They did not receive the proper treatment to, to cure their illness. Because what they wanted to do is to check the impact of the disease over time. And uh, they um, picked this uh, group because at that time, the, uh, the, this race was uh, treated as uh, inferior. And um, so that's, that uh, kind of um, ties back to the institutional racism that we just had the, the definition read about. So let's go through and let's see what happened in, in this study. This is also an example of racial bias in subject selection. So benefits for the participants in exchange for taking part of the study, the men received free medical exams, free meals and burial insurance. The study is supposed to um, take place for six months. However, it actually lasted seven, uh, lasted until 1972. It lasted for 40 years. Now, what are the damages and injustices that happened here? The men were never given adequate treatment for their disease. Even when penicillin became the drug of choice for syphilis in 1947, and if you remember, the study started in 1932, researchers did not offer it to the subjects. They didn't even mention that's a possibility. The subjects were never given the choice of quitting the study, even when this new highly effective treatment became widely used. So that is the study, and that is a, a, a very great injustice, what happened. The damage is done to the African-American and also the injustices uh, and the, uh, uh, was put in this group. It's horrendous. It's a very um, um, sad practice that, that they performed in Tuskegee. However, uh, in uh, 1972, um, this uh, uh, study, what was happening, was published uh, in the news, and then the, the study was shut down. And uh, then compensation started to uh, take place, so to patients, to family members, and descendants. So 10 million, 10 million out of court settlements were given out, uh, medical benefits and burial services were given to participants, and then it was extended also to family members and descendants. In 1997, on May 16th, uh, President Bill Clinton uh, offered an apology to the participants, their families, the descendants, and also many of the medical workers who participated in the study. Many of them were not aware of what is the a real um, purpose of the study was. So uh, President Clinton gave um, an apology to the participants, um, both as patients and medical, medical assistants. And so positive outcomes. In 1974, the National Research Act was signed into law and is also started and created the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. So this commission was created. And we're going to talk about this commission because they really done uh, great things. Um, but going forward in time, in 2001, the President's Council of Bioethics was established which advises the president on ethical issues related to, adv uh, to advances in biomedical science and technology. So these were some of the positive outcomes from this study. So let's go forward and let's see some more of the outcomes where really positively affected uh, research and uh, the participation of, of human subject in research in, in uh, respect to race and ethical issues. So um, the National Commission of, uh, for the Protection of Human Subject of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, uh, this commission, then um, 
uh, had a long, long uh, session, and it lasted for four years. And they studied uh, what happened at Tuskegee. And they created a summary uh, at their last meeting, which, which took, uh, took place um, the, uh, in 1976 for four days. And they created a summary and a report. That report is now referred to as the Belmont Report. And so in this Belmont report, um, they established three ethical principles that should guide human research. And it's all because of what happened at Tuskegee. So the three ethical principles are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. So let's see what they mean. Respect for persons. All individuals should be treated as autonomous agents and persons with, with diminished, diminished autonomy are entitled to, to protection. So, so everybody has to be treated with respect and has to be explained what is the study about. They can have a choice of participating or not participating. And also if there is a, a, a child or there is someone who cannot make a decision, then they are entitled to protection by their family or other agents that assign to them. So respect for, respect for persons. Ben beneficence. Researchers should maximize possible benefits through research and minimize possible, minimize possible harm. And so that's very important. And it also brings to question whether or not the Tuskegee um, study, uh, what, uh, how much benefit is actually provided at the cost of how much harm. So justice, all persons should be treated equally and the selection of research subject should be scrutinized so that no one is systematically selected on the bias of race, ethnicity, class, or other factors. And that's the, uh, the, the part of, of the justice of the three ethical principles. And there is uh, other positive outcomes of this. So let's go and look at the next uh, positive outcome. <clears throat> so on July 12, 1974, the National Research Act established the existence of IRBs, which are institutional review boards. These are committees that review biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects. So the role of this uh, body is to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects recruited to participate in research activities conducted under the, the institution with which it is affiliated. And so the IRB must be guided by the same three principles of the Belmont Report, respect for, respect for persons, beneficence, justice. So the, the, IR, uh, the IRB receives a proposal for human uh, research. They receive the, what kind of treatments uh, these uh, uh, patients uh, and um, subjects would receive, what are the benefits, what are the side effects, what kind of harm it can be done. Uh, they also check whether or not these participants uh, are planned to be informed what, in what way and if any of these um, uh, principles, the respect for person, beneficence, or justice, are not met for in that proposal, the IRB has uh, <clears throat> the right to not allow that study to take place. So that's uh, a beautiful outcome of, uh, of the Belmont report. <clears throat> now, however, there are very, very serious negative outcomes. And that one is uh, mistrust. Um, and so that is uh, coming from uh, uh, an article written in uh, 2010. Uh, the title is More Than Tuskegee, Understanding Mistrust About Research Participation. It's an original article. And the participants here were 70 African-American individuals. And it was like a, a workshop. Uh, these participants were in groups of 10 and 11 uh, uh, individuals, and they talked about their opinion of get, getting involved with uh, studies <clears throat> uh, uh, research as a research subject. And so uh, these interviews then were um, collated and the opinions were, were um, 
gathered and I've uh, actually took some of the opinions of the participants here. So maybe we can read them together. One of the reasons most black people are reluctant to, to get involved is suspicion. We have been kind of brainwashed and we are guinea pigs. And this feeling of being guinea pigs is really uh, comes from negative experiences. Toskuji will be one of the major ones for African-American individuals. I think you have a lot of people who mistrust the government. You start looking at a lot of medical centers, they are always going to be some link of the chains to some government entity. So mistrust also comes uh, <clears throat> uh, because the Tuskegee study was um, directed by the government. And since most medical institutions, as, as this uh, entry just mentioned, has um, relations uh, to some contact and links to the government, if nothing else, that it has to be approved uh, by um, a government agency for the study to take place. Uh, because the government um, did not protect African-American individuals in the Tuskegee case, now it always comes in question whether or not uh, these individuals can trust the government, that government will going to look after their best interest. It's Tuskegee, it is, it is part of the socio sociological and theological question, who are we and why are we in this position? So it is again, um, uh, African American individuals feel very deeply about what happened at Tuskegee and that, that it can happen again. Um, and the next as entry is uh, actually talks about the apology that um, uh, President Clinton offered. I was actually there for the satellite te telecast of the apology. I got to see some of the participants and it was pretty profound hearing what some of them had to go through. I know now the university has a whole new medical center and they got a lot of money, but that can't make up for it. And you can't go back and change what happened. I can't speak for other people, but that was a huge emotional experience for me. So Tuskegee, has an effect even today of, of what happened there. And um, so that is why it's so important that uh, they, there should be no racial bias in subject selection. And if we go back to just to talk a little bit about the positive once more, that the um, Belmont report, as well as the, the IRB, uh, are, are uh, really, really seriously taking responsibility to uh, uphold these three ethical principles of respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. So that's the Tuskegee uh, report. And so what, now that we, we listen to what happened there, then um, to protect the individuals who wanna, um, want to participate in, in a study, uh, what kind of information we think we would like to offer, or if you want to be a uh, participant, what kind of information we would like to have in order to, to make uh, a decision to participate or not to participate in a study. So what I want us to do, so if we can maybe uh, we discuss this a little bit, that <clears throat> what, are the, what, what are the things that we may uh, want to have it, it's right now it's termed as an informed consent form. And some of us know what, what has to be in it. But for some of us who don't know, what may be those uh, items that after hearing what happened at Tuskegee, so that it will never happen again, what may, may we want to have in, 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 uh, in a consent, in an informed consent form? And so we can just brainstorm.
Andrei, you may be talking, but uh, somehow I cannot hear. If someone hears no, what you I said. I wasn't talking. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say the type of study, the length of the study. Yeah. Who um, will be part of the study? Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. And these are actually part of it. Yes. Any, yeah. Anyone else who would think of maybe some additional? Yes, Susan, go ahead. I would say that the risks need to be spelled out, the risks mm -hmm. and the benefits. Excellent. Yes, exactly right. Anyone else who would like to add? We don't have to. Just if you have a thought, it's not mandatory. Hi, Sister Joan. Yeah, um, I can, we cannot hear you. Would you outmute? Would you unmute yourself? That would be really great. Anyone can hear Dr. Uh, anyone can hear Sister Joan because uh, Joan because I cannot hear her. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Sister Joanne wanted to say wonderful things. Uh, so it's um yeah. <clears throat> maybe she she might um if she can unmute, maybe she'll chime in later. Yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> so let's go then back to the, the slideshow. And uh, these were all wonderful suggestions. So let's see what are the main there are many subsets of this, but let's see what are the main um ideas here that definitely the informed consent should have. And <clears throat> the components it must have. So we have here uh, one, two, three, it's a five and also an eight um, parts. So the description of clinical investigation, exactly as uh, uh, Andre just said, it has to be uh, described. Uh, and this will also contain how long the study will be, uh, how the information will be used, uh, and how long it will be used. Risk and discomfort, uh, of course, it has to be. Uh, 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 clearly stated in a language that is easy to understand to the participants. Benefits, what are the, the benefits that it can come out as uh, the participant for the uh, participant themselves and overall. Alternative procedures or treatments, it's very important that, you know, in the, in, as you remember in the Tuskegee study, uh, the, the study started in 1932, it went until 1972, and in 1947, they had the treatment, but they did not inform the patients about it. So it's it's in the uh, consent, uh, the informed consent form has uh, an element is going to say if alternative treatment or procedure will be available during the study, the individuals running the study have to inform the participants about this alternative and give them the choice to keep participating in the study or leave the study than to uh, uh, make use of this alternative alternative procedure or treatment. Then, of course, confidentiality. And <clears throat> if there, yes, uh -huh. is there any th thoughts? I'm sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to, if you have a question or thought. Yes, Sister Joan. Yeah, talk, yes, I'm so glad you're here. I know you had some comments. Please go. Please tell us. It, can you hear me? Yes, now perfectly. Oh, yeah, so happy about that. Yeah, great. No, that's you know what I I had some experience around that time. Uh, mm -hmm. 1965. I was graduating from nursing school, mm -hmm. and my classmates and I every day we would uh, get more mail, more mail about joining the armed services that mm -hmm. they really wanted, um, you know, nurses to come, and the come on. Um, 
for some of our black students was this was kind of a way out of New Jersey. They had never been beyond Bayonne, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, however, what they did was they, um, two of the young women decided they were gonna go into the Air Force. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of them said, I want to um, do something special for the Air Force to include more women. Mm -hmm. But I have two children at home. Mm -hmm. And I, there was no husband around or no father around. So um, they said, well, we'll look at it. We'll look at it. Do you know that they took her? Mm. And, the, and the other uh, student, uh, well, she graduated then. She wanted to do something far away. So they mm -hmm. sent her to Japan. Mm. So they wow. were, I mean, so they did give up a lot of um, jobs here and mm -hmm. to be, but in order to make it for this, the United States, they were really putting their life on the line. One mm. girl went right into uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Wow. That's amazing. She was in Vietnam. And um, years later, she's now buried in Arlington National Cemetery mm -hmm. because um, she, uh, the, we, the problems with the inhaling all the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the bombs and everything that was yes, going yeah. on, mm -hmm. it, affect, it affected her. However, but they, they were really like experimental. And I really mm -hmm. give it, give these girls a, a, a lot mm -hmm. of credit, you know? Yeah, I agree. The black agree. girls that did it. Yes, yeah. It's not easy to make a decision to uh, become a participant of any 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 in a study or an uh, experiments. It's uh, yeah, and I think you're totally uh, you're really right, Sister Joan. That you know, it's it's it requires a lot of consideration, and you have to really know what you're what you're signing up for. And and so the um, informed consent the informed consent form is really uh it's a very important part of the documentation and i think we are very uh, lucky that we have this now and it's very unfortunate that at that time this was in not in place and uh there was no um pressure or or, or enforcement to actually uh, to actually use this and to be truthful of about what what is going on and so uh, just to complete this slide, and we're going to go to uh, a, a little bit of a different topic. So compensation and medical treatments uh, in event of injury has to be included. Contact information for uh, physicians in, because these volunteers usually go home. And then, they, they, uh, then if something happens, who they would contact. And it's, it has to be voluntary participation. So um, in these studies, after the, everything is uh, explained to uh, 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 potential participants, it always has to be given time for them to make a decision. So it couldn't be like, you, you know, to sign up in two hours or not even a day. So, so it has to be well thought through and then it has to be voluntary. And um, so these are- the And reasons. also Dr. Berkey, yeah, yeah. The, the language has to be clear. It cannot be ambiguous where mm -hmm. they say one thing and then it means something else. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And now what happens is some of these studies actually um, hire or have a person who uh, kind of checks this and also uh, uh, not only the medical person is there, but also another individual who also explains and then answer questions. And it's really true. It has to be very, very clear in the language. And many times, if the English is not the first language of the participants, then there is um, uh, uh, effort uh, to uh, translate everything to that language so that it can be even more clear and more understandable for the participants if they wish to participate. So it's really, really true. Thank you, Andre, to, to mentioning that. It's it, to emphasizing that it's really, really true. So with this, we kind of, uh, it was one module. So we have two modules in this talk. So the first module is now completed. And so the second module, we're going to talk about more about higher education and STEM and um, uh, racial bias in um, in um, these areas. So the first will be race, ethnicity, and college acceptance. So I found a couple of studies uh, talking about 
because uh, when I talked to Sophie, she really wanted to me to focus on also what, what maybe what kind of trends are existing in uh, education, uh, uh, in college education and the STEM field in general. So I looked at some of the information and <clears throat> what I found is I put here and um, what happens is that it's the majority of institutions actually uh, do not uh, have um, bias in accepting college, college applicants. And um, so for example, RCD, RCD Kono uh, at all in 2010 said that nationally, the vast majority of undergraduate institutions accept all qualified candidates and thus do not award special status to any groups of applicants defined by race or on the basis of other uh, other criterion. Then also <clears throat> uh, that, and the reason behind this is when they stated is that because um, there are uh, less number of applicants than most of the time uh, uh, the, the colleges and universities would accept, so they really cannot choose and pick. However, um, However, in um, Ivy League uh, institutions, that's not the case. Uh, they can choose, and um, it's usually a fact about 20% of um, individuals going to uh, colleges, universities, and higher education that that um, um, uh, racial bias would, um, would be um, at play. So, um, uh, there is the affirmative action, which was uh, by the government, which was uh, released in 2003, and uh, that um, uh, gave instructions to institutions how to um, eliminate um, racial uh, bias in selecting candidates and uh, accepting candidates. And so, um, however, it also had like um, a little bit of uh, um, backfiring. So that's why it had to have a, a correction to it. And so here is what Yurling in 2004 is talking about. The education benefits resulting from a diverse student body can be a compelling government interest, but not to the extent that such a preference ensures the admission of nearly every minority applicant who is minimally qualified. So to, to kind of balance this out, then this affirmative action was also uh, uh, took place. But um, in overall, <clears throat> uh, overall, it seems that the majority of universities and uh, higher education do not have um, acceptance bias uh, based on race or ethnicity. Now, uh, just recently, the Inside Higher Ed had a survey and uh, all races mentioned that it has to be su such, a, such a way that should be no um, college acceptance bias based on race or ethnicity. And so this is the 73% of white, black, Latino, and Asian Americans shared this opinion. So that's uh, about up applications and acceptance to colleges. However, there are still, if we look at STEM, and we're going to go to the STEM, um, college acceptance, um, that there is uh, actually, unfortunately, um, a negative effect of, um, uh, of for minority um, applicants pursuing STEM education. So there is a barrier. And so let's see what this barrier is. So we have two studies here, Sander and Taylor, and RCD Akono uh, talks about it. So let's read the first one. Large admissions preferences to minority college students, steer these students away from majoring in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields, since they will not have the right foundation. So by uh, admitting um, uh, minority students uh, who do not have the right background, that, and they come to the science um, um, uh, fields, because other students who may be not minority students and they want to pursue uh, science, they will have a better foundation. And so they can succeed in those courses while a minority student not having the right foundation may not succeed. And then what it will result that these students will go into switch out from that major. So which means they, they be lost for the STEM field. 
So let's see what RCD Kono is, is, is mentioning. Natural science, engineering, and economics courses are more difficult associated with higher study times and have harsher grading standards, all of which translate into student with students with weaker academic backgrounds being less likely to choose these majors. Indeed, we show in, they show it in their uh, uh, article that accounting for academic background can fully account for every average differences in switching behavior between blacks and whites so that they will switch out from the STEM majors. So, um, so it is, um, so that's one of the, the barriers for um, uh, minority um, um, college students to continue and uh, to, um, with STEM majors. And so in our university, we really try to, um, to counterbalance that. Uh, to give uh, those students, uh, because we have ver various organizations on campus as well as uh, in our departments and other departments, to help these uh, minority students who may not have the academic background to help them to catch up so that they can then pursue STEM, uh, STEM um, fields. So I, I just, but I wanted to mention this study about um, what, may, uh, what some of the barriers, at least at the college level. And so now we're going to move now to employment in STEM. So first we're going to look at some of the statistics and then talk about the barriers. So in 2013, Funk and Parker had this uh, article where they summarized what are the percentages of Black and Hispanic workers in STEM workforce. And it, uh, they are the Black individuals are 9% and Hispanic is 7%. And so these percents are really, really underrepresentations in the STEM workforce. And then if we look at the degrees that um, these individuals may have, then bachelor's degree or higher, the black um, individuals uh, are only 70% and Hispanics are 6% at the workforce. And uh, Asians, however, are overrepresented in STEM fields and 70% of college educated uh, or higher in the STEM workforce. So there are um, um, various um, uh, um, uh, uh, treatments in a way uh, that uh, based on race and ethnicity in the STEM fields. So let's look at now some of the barriers that are uh, presented uh, by the African-American and Hispanic individuals, why uh, it is that the STEM workforce uh, has such an underrepresentation uh, in, 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 in those uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds. So lack of quality education. So it comes from uh, even from before college and then in college it can uh, play a big role not for, this, for these individuals to these students to switch from the major. Uh, the obtaining the college degree like because of again uh, if the background from high school is not uh, appropriate for STEM majors. Difficulty in employment entry by, and we're going to have a little study together, by uh, the, even by the name there is discrimination. Discrimination in recruitment, hiring, lower pay, and, and there is a difficulty in, in advancing in promotions. And going back to even earlier time, lack of encouragement to pursue these jobs from early age, lack of role models. And um, so here are some, some comments from individuals who, who were, um, again, Funk and Parker had an uh, interview with these individuals. And so I collected some of their, um, their um, comments. So people look at the color of my skin and automatically start doubting my ability and my knowledge of my job. And it's an Asian woman, a surgeon. My skills are secondary to my race. My race is seen first. It's a black woman and she's a database administrator, age of 60. The workplace is still geared to the promotion of whites over minorities, regardless of the laws in place to promote equality in the workforce. Hispanic man, he's an engineer, 65. So uh, Hispanics are looked down upon as stupid. Hispanic woman, physician, 48. And also uh, there is another side of this. Um, as a white male, nothing is a given now. You have to fight harder to overcome institutional and government reverse discrimination. 
white man in industrial and medical engineer 55. So these are some of the comments that I picked out from this report. And so what I would like us to do together, it's like a little exercise that um, to see how this bias is actually plays out just by using names. So there was a study by Flaherty in 2019, and it was um, reported also. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. 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 Okay, so I was thinking someone when I asked a question. Um, I, I apologize. So in this, uh, what happened was the, the, the researchers contacted 251 faculty members. Actually, they contacted more, but 251 faculty members were participating, and 90% were physicists and 65% were biologists. They were working at universities and various institutions. And so they were asked, these professors of physics and biology were asked to read and evaluate the CV of a hypothetical recent PhD who is going to become a postdoctoral fellow. So it's like a continuous education in their institution, uh, either for uh, phys physics as a, phys a physics postdoc or a biology postdoc. And so the, it's very interesting. What they used as a test material, they used one CV and they only changed the name and the gender on that, and the, the candidate's gender, the, the name, the gender, and the race, of course, but the race was evident from the name. And so the names on the CV were Bradley Miller, white man, Claire Miller, white woman, Zhangwei David, Asian man, Wang Li, Lily, Asian woman, Jamal Banks, uh, Banks black man, and Shanice Bla Banks, black woman, Jose Rodriguez, Latino man, Maria Rodriguez, Latino woman. So they just only changed the names. Oh, the CV was exactly the same. And so let's see what the outcome was. And then maybe we can make a decision what it is that they did. And what I wanted to say is, I'm not sure um, that it says, but the in the 90% of the uh, these faculty members in physics were men and 65% biologists were male. So, okay, so let's look at it. So what we look at here in these little bars, box bars, that um, what these 251 uh, professors use, use looking the same CV, so only the race and the, uh, and the, the gender was different, how they evaluated the same CV. So what we can look at, what we can see here, the one that has a higher uh, little blue area with a uh, black line in the middle is the, they, by, based on the name and the race, they had the preference. So this one is physicist, physics professors rated postdoctoral, can, postdoctoral candidates for physicist position. So let's see if we can look at what in your screen, I'm, I'm not sure you can see, what was the most favored um, race and gender by these um, uh, professors. Can, can anyone see that from the chart? Looks like the Asian male. Exactly right. Asian male was the most favored. And so let's see which was the least favored. Uh, African American female. Yeah, so that would be like nice. longer. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. So that right. was not favored. Also, usually, what also helps us. So that was one of the lowest ones. Exactly. So this is uh, amongst the top, the lowest three. African American female was the lowest one. Then Hispanic female and Hispanic yeah. male. Mm -hmm. African American female, Hispanic female, and Hispanic male. Is it not amazing? It's really a, an amazing finding. That's really amazing, right? Based on the, the CV was the same. Based on the name and gender, they, you know, it's just, it's just really, right? So let's see now the biology, right? Let's see the biology one. So biology professors rated postdoc candidates for a biology postdoc position. And so let's see what are the outcomes. So what was the most preferred gender and uh, a, a race? So again, we look at the little blue. Mm -hmm. Asian male. Asian male, yes, Asian male was. And then let's see what was the least favored. Um, African-American male. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. 
So it's again, and of course it could be ranked and they also made a comparison between males and females. In this talk, we didn't focus on uh, like gender differences. I, we focused more about um, race, races. Um, and so this is the outcome here uh, when they put together in biology faculty rates, uh, readers saw Asian candidates as more competent and where you're hiring than black candidates and as more hireable than Latin Latinx candidates. So Asian, black, Latinx. And physicists rated Asians and white candidates as more competent compared to black and Latinx candidates. And, um, and of course they talk about men and women. And so uh, the question also is whether the gender of participants make a difference. So ma mainly these were males and I just uh, your opinion, it's really, you know, we're not going to just uh, whether or not it would be more women, would that make a difference of the, what do you think if this ranking, if there would be more women in, in the uh, pe people who judged uh, the CVs? Hmm. But the biology was about 60%, 40%. So that was more. Yeah, it, 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 Daryl, I, 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 I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I was saying, I was saying, but you said for the, for the physics one, it was about 90% yeah, male. Yeah. For the biologists who rated the biologists, that yeah, was more yeah. like 60, 40 split. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, uh, even when we had more women, we, there was still uh, still a bias uh, based on based on um, on uh, on the names and and uh, I mean based on the ethnicity. So it may have made a slight difference, like which would come, uh, but uh, it's really uh, similar. So and so because this so we see this bias right it's just the study showed clearly the bias so what is the solution and so one that is suggested uh, by the article and also is that adopting anti-bias trainings right so that that we re realize that uh, and i and i think we had in the university we had this anti-bias training uh I, I i remember i had i did that last year, and so to realize our own and, uh, and uh, our own bias and recognize it, and then consciously then um, counter counteract that uh, to to be fair. And so, um, any other uh, thoughts? How maybe these biases could be um, could be um, remedied? But just any opinion? It's really not. It's just a brainstorming. So can Maybe. you not? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Dara. Sorry. Oh, uh, I was going to say, can you not include applicants' names if you just had them candidate one, two, three? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be one. And I think Stacy maybe wanted to say something. That was mine also. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and there are efforts to have these blind CVs in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, of course, there are various efforts and... Um, so there, just to, to close on a positive note, here is the anti-racism NIH efforts. And so uh, it, the NIH gave this, it's uh, their uh, web page about their efforts. So NIH is committed to breaking down the barriers that prevent the full breadth of talent from contributing to the biomedical enterprise. The enterprise is strengthened when it harnesses the complete intellectual capacity of the nation, bringing diverse, diverse perspectives, backgrounds, and skill sets to apply to complex problems. We recognize our efforts aimed at achieving scientific workforce diversity and hindered by organizational, which are hindered by organizational structures, systems, and policies that perpetuate exclusion and inequity based on race. Organizational structures, policies, practices, and social norms that perpetuate bias, prejudice, discrimination, and racism limit the pace of scientific progress. So I thought it would be a nice uh, like a closure for what we were talking about because there are efforts uh, already in place to, to recognize talents. It doesn't matter what ethnicity and race it's coming from. And so with this, um, uh, the, 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 my presentation is concluded. However, I would like to 
um, um, kind of summarize what we talked about. We had the definition of the uh, racism. We talked about racism and the very uh, grave, grievous um, um, case study, the Tuskegee study. We talked about it, but it has positive outcomes. Unfortunately, it has negative outcomes as well. And we talked about education and STEM degree, obtaining a STEM degree and STEM opportunities and barriers. And we, we closed on hopefully in a positive note. And with this, I also would like to thank you um, for uh, listening. And I want to also acknowledge Sophie Hicks, who reached out uh, to be part of this wonderful lecture series. Thank you, Colleen and Abdul Staten for including me here. I want to thank Robin Devon Davenport for sending me this positive note about the AI and NIH uh, declaration. And again, one more time, thank you for listening. And if you have questions, if you would like to discuss anything, uh, please feel free. And uh, with this, I will going to close my uh, slideshow. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Berkey. Um, so we have about uh, like, you know, seven or so minutes left today. And um, part two will be next week where it will be a little bit more like time for discussion and stuff. So, but if anyone has any uh, immediate questions for Dr. Berkey, I'm gonna stop the recording. So, um, so we won't record the discussion um, element. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them. If not, we can wait till next week.